All right, everyone, I think it's a good time to start. So thank you for coming in to join us. And I'm going to hand us on over to Monica for our introduction. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to our program celebrating Black excellence in Maryland libraries. My name is Monica Powell, and I am a library associate with the Anne Arundel County Public Library. It is my honor to welcome you all here tonight. This program is presented in partnership with our friends at Frederick County Public Libraries. And as Anne Arundel County Public Library celebrates our 100th birthday, we are taking time to highlight some of the wonderful talent within our profession. I wanna recognize that this is only a portion of the black excellence in our libraries. We are celebrating all who share their expertise with Maryland libraries. During tonight's program, we will plan to have some time at the end to answer your questions. Please share anything you would like to ask our panelists and moderator in the Q&A box. If you have any technical issues, please use chat to speak with Katie or me, and we will be happy to assist you. With the permission of our esteemed guests, tonight's event will be recorded. Without further delay, welcome again to Celebrating Black Excellence in Maryland Libraries. All right, good evening, everybody. Thank you, Monica, for that beautiful introduction. My name is Joy. I am a library associate in Anne Arundel County Public Libraries, and I have the privilege of being your moderator tonight. So I'd like the panelists to please introduce yourselves. Marcy, would you please introduce yourself? Thank you for inviting me to be part of this panel, Joy. I am pleased to be with you. And although I retired several years ago, I'm always happy to talk about the value and benefits of librarians and the things that we bring. So I'm Marcy Pride, and I uh, was the dean of a large university library, and I've also worked in special and public libraries along the way. All right, thank you so much, Marcy. And Erin, could you please introduce yourself? Hello, my name is Erin Neal. I'm from Frederick County Public Library System in Frederick County, um, Frederick, Maryland. Um, I've been there for four years um, next month. Um, and I'm a librarian for their system for adult and teen services. All right, thank you, Erin. And Angela. Um, hi, I am Angela Kukui. I am in my last um, semester of the University of Maryland College Park MLS program. I'm excited. Um, and I'm also, um, I work in outreach and public service coordination for the Robert L. Bogomoni Library at the University of Baltimore. Excellent. Last semester, so exciting. <laughs> excellent, excellent. And Jasmine, please introduce yourself. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for attending. I'm Jasmine Shoemaker. I'm a reference and instruction librarian at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Thank you, Jasmine and Michelle. Hi, everyone. I'm Michelle Noble. I'm a branch manager for the Anne Arundel County Public Library. Um, I've been in Anne Arundel for 28 years and managing this branch for 13 years. Well, thank you all so much for being here and be, for being willing to share your expertise. I just wanted to jump into my first question, whether personal or professional, how did you get your start in the library? or your first library experiences that stuck out to you? I'll jump in um, if you're not gonna call on us. I started um, actually as a part-time staff member in the public relations department. I was primarily responsible for the staff newsletter, which meant I was driving to branches, um, interviewing staff and reporting on special events and I kind of liked what I saw. Uh, the library was exciting. Um, there was lots of interaction with a lot of different people. And even if the librarians sometimes seemed harried, they seemed happy. So I liked them and I think they liked me because they invited me to interview for an open position. And uh, here I am 28 years and six branches later. 
right, that is so great. <laughs> that's 28, that is that's fantastic. Fantastic, so much experience. And Marcy, did, you said you had a similar background, you said also in PR. Uh, well, I, I'm an introvert of the highest order. And as a child, I found great joy in going to the library to read, to learn, to explore um, new places and possibilities. So when a new library opened in my neighborhood, I was ecstatic. I was about 12 years old at the time. And after my chores were done on Saturday, I could either take my bike or walk to the library. And I was usually there from 12 noon to about 4.30 when the library closed. I was a faithful, diligent patron. The librarians were so engaging and helpful, and I really admired and appreciated them. They always made me feel welcome. And after they learned what I liked to read, uh, they were sure to share new items with me as they came in. So to me, it was nearly heaven on earth. And from that day to this day, I still remember the feelings that were evoked during that time. And I can also say to you that although I could not articulate it at the time, I realized then that the library was about information, oh. imagination, inspiration, and even in some cases, transformation. And I was just hooked. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Can you remember a specific time or a specific interaction with the librarians that stuck with you? Um, uh, one of my favorite authors was uh, a woman named Rosemond Dujardin, and she wrote about a girl named, by the way, Marcy. And, and so these were basically coming of age books. And I just remember when the new Marcy books would come. They would, I was the first one who ever read whatever new Marcy book came to that library. And that just was wonderful to me because if that Marcy could do it, then I could do it too, whatever it was, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. Just for you, that personal, personal yeah. moment. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Erin, Angela, Jasmine, how did you start your library journeys? Um, so for me, um, it all started in elementary school. They would bring home these colorful book lists of like, you can check it off and you can bring it back. And, um, you know, you'll have all these books on Friday that your parents pay for to take home. Um, and for me, being raised by a single mother, I could not get that big pile on those Fridays. Um, so I look forward to Wednesday. Um, where we went to the library. And a lot of times I still had those um, books circled on my list and that librarian, she would read some of those um, books. And as soon as she put those books down on that shelf, I was the first to take out my paper library card and say, hey, I want this book. And so um, for that little moment, I was able to have a brand new book to take home, so. That was one of my experiences. It's beautiful. I can see plenty of people in the chat are identifying with your experiences as you guys are <laughs> listening right now. That's a very common experience, I think, especially with so many people to have these connections with the library and to have those personal moments. Angela, Jasmine. Uh, yeah, similar to Aaron's point, I kind of started my involvement with the library at a very young age. I grew up going to the Severn Public Library Mm -hmm. um, and I can remember that being the first time that I felt really responsible for something and holding on to that, that library card, it seemed so big in my hands and what that meant to like, be able to, you know, have that responsibility to check out a book, to bring them back, to get more. Um, and I was completely obsessed with the Arthur books, with the Dear America <laughs> diary books, um, to the point where, you know, I would be reading them just ragged. So I, I think... It started there, but I'm glad that it didn't end there. I like that you mentioned responsibility. You know, we definitely think of libraries as also being a place for imagination, a place for innovation and creativity, but also can teach you responsibility. And those mm -hmm. also very important life lessons too. What about you, Angela, when you started your library journey? 
I, un I thought back and I was unconsciously engaged in the library since I was a child rejecting it. <laughs> um, <laughs> I remember the little assessments they gave us in elementary school and it determined what you should be and rather you should be a nurse or a teacher. And it said I should be a librarian. And I was like, no, <laughs> this is not, no. <laughs> so um, I remember Maya Angelou saying when she was a child, she would, she felt safe in the library. And that's what it was for me as a child. I felt safe. Um, I was having some anxiety as a child, you know, we growing up in Baltimore, it's a lot of things you are trauma to. And I remember going to the library just to escape that. And I was just sitting there and the librarian came over and handed me um, the Judy Blooms, uh, are you there guard is me, Margaret. And that's when I got hooked. I was like, okay, <laughs> all right. This, this place understands me because that book, it felt like it was just reading my life at that moment. So I've always appreciated the library, but I didn't understand my version my my reason for loving it so much until i became much older <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so do you think that that was also part of why you started to consider working in a library as a career no Down the road? Okay. <laughs> All right. I, I, i'm glad you asked that question because it was like a two-part question mm -hmm. my later in life discovery of the library is that coming back to Baltimore City um, from Northern Virginia, um, I was trying to find myself, like trying to figure out how did I get here and why are the conditions in my community getting worse than from when I grew up? So where do you get that information from? You have to go to a library and an archive. So at, at 40 years old, I'm a patron going into the library asking about information in the archives. And in that space, I found myself. No, I, I really found myself. There were pictures of me in the archives at University of Baltimore. So when I found that, I felt it was so free and liberating to me. So my purpose for being here is, just, is more than just my enthusiastic um, uh, focus on reading. It's about how, how empowering it is that our profession gives information that helps society as a whole. And I really want with all my heart to create a, a space for people that look like me to be free, if not um, monetarily in, uh, through their mind. And that's what I felt I was feeling when I started um, working in the library. And I just want people that look like me to have that experience, so. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So that leads me into another question, Michelle, I want to go to you first. So AACPL and Orlando County Public Library is celebrating its 100th anniversary this year. How would you like to see AACPL when it celebrates 200 years? <sighs> well, at 200, I, I would like, um, I, I am positive there will be more staff who look like and speak like the customers that we serve. Mm -hmm. uh, I am positive that those staff will be working in modern, forward-thinking, flexible facilities, um, that there will be more co-working spaces in those facilities, more gathering spaces, um, and that we would have firmly established our virtual footprint through wonderful programs like these, mm -hmm. um, but also that staff aren't tethered to those spaces, that we are out more meeting people where they are. Mm -hmm. How do you think that it would be the best way for us to do that, to accomplish that? Or what are some ways that we can really get that together? I, I like the path that we're on. I know that the pandemic pushed us into uh, becoming more of a virtual library and we should certainly stay there. Um, I like our focus on outreach. Um, I like the changes I see at our library headquarters because um, 28 years ago, there were no people at headquarters who looked like me um, mm -hmm. except for the receptionist. Um, and maybe some support staff. Now people who look like me have the title chief at our library headquarters and that is so exciting. So I really feel like we're on the right path. Excellent, yeah, chief manager, absolutely. Mm -hmm. All levels. So does anyone else have a response to that question where they will, might like to see Anne Arundel County or any of their other systems in the next hundred years? 
would just like to add, um, I remember seeing a couple of years ago, the extreme pushback in the news when Anne Arundel County Public Library System um, wanted to move forward with a drag story time mm -hmm. and, and a program that was very controversial, you know, so controversial that it ended up in the news and had to be voted on by the board. And it really made me feel like this word diversity I really hope that we move away from that and it just becomes a program, not just a black program or an LGBTQ program, but it's just a program and it's just normalized. Mm -hmm. And I feel like when something has that label, it might, I don't know, it just, I feel like we should move towards just having programs and not like labeling them that way. And I hope that that will come for this system, but also just systems across the country too. Now, Jasmine, people may hear that and they would think, oh, okay, so we shouldn't be focusing on Black communities. We shouldn't be fo focusing on immigrant communities or Asians or anything. You know, it should just be a program. What do you say to kind of make that more, you know? I think the language just has to be normalized, right? Like uh, right. not having to surround your programs over Black History Month. And then you that's the only time you see a black presenter or black content um same thing with asian pacific islander you know month um hispanic awareness anything like that i think just kind of normalizing and bringing open this this very open dialogue that we don't have to have that attachment onto a program that it gets that that certain recognition just just come to it right just have it and people will come right if you have it people will come mm -hmm. exactly and I think also, and tell me, you guys, if you agree, but also just making it not, just like you said, Jasmine, don't make it just something that you check the box of, okay, we did, we did the Black thing, we did the gay thing, we did the, you know, whatever it is, and we put out our statement to stop Asian hate, but to not actually go through within all aspects of your organization, whether it's in the programs, the collection, what you put on display, all of it. Right. Anyone else have anything to add to that point? Yeah, I think um, I'll just add a couple of things maybe, and some of those things go along with what both Jasmine and um, um, Michelle said. And I think you're doing it. I think um, in part, it, it basically boils down to finding a need and filling it. Um, it's kind of like uh, when, the, when Alice asked the Cheshire cat which road to take, and he said, it all depends on where you want to go. And so you are about having this program and then by moving this program from a, a finite event to a broader event or to a more um, inclusive kind of activity, you're doing that. And so to me, you ask the right questions. You ask who uses the library and why do they use the library? And who is it in the community who doesn't use the library, but could benefit from what the library provides. You ask, uh, what will our neighborhood, our community look like in 200 years? And what will its goals be? And then I think, what can the library do to help realize those goals? As you know, as, as one of my favorites um, often said, if you begin with the end in mind, you would be ahead of the game. And so my question would then be, and it goes along with what both Michelle and Jasmine said, what is your vision for the library? What do you think the library could and should be for the people that we want to serve? Mm -hmm. Asking the community. Yeah. Well, my next question I wanted to ask you guys, what major hurdles did you overcome as library professionals? Let's take a moment. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anyone can start on this one. Um, it, it was a hurdle for me because I, this was not my first selected career. I'm from the corporate um, background, and I was a business profession, and I mean, a business professional. So in my field, I had an assignment in my job, and then 
other people had their assignments, but we were all collectively um, doing our equal part. Um, coming into the library, I'm excited. I'm thinking this is the best field in the world because once again, information science, how can, how can life function without us? With the lawyers and doctors, their hierarchy is there, but they had to come to the library to get that information to become who they are. So that's my value about the library. But I realized that on campuses and even in public library, I don't see people or institutions valuing us. And you see that based on the budgets. You know, what's the first thing that gets pulled? What's the first thing that gets compromised is the library. So my, my first experience with that is just that whole, that hierarchiness and that being a person of color coming in at my age, it was, um, even though I came from another space where I was the only um, black person in there, I kind of felt it in this field. Um, you know, it's about what, 79, 80% of white women in the field compared to less than 5% and um, that identifies African-American. And the people at our library in particular, some of them don't even come from Baltimore. And um, so it's kind of hard to have them understand my value because I'm, you know, they're looking at me from as an outsider and not as a person, you know, from the MLS background. So it was just so many complex things for myself trying to identify how do I fit into this? And even in the MLS program, I, and I'm gonna say this, I, I, my, first, my first semester, I took all of the core classes like a fool. And I was like, I don't belong here. This is very white womanish. And I just, just didn't understand it. So all, all the aspects of what this is was very complex for me. So that's why I feel like my presence here is so necessary. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. And um, Aaron, what about you? Um, so for me, I'm probably now one of two black librarians in Frederick County Public Library System. Um, and for me, um, right after George Floyd's murder, I said, we have to do something. We had to get some kind of platform within our system. And my my administration was welcoming and they said okay let's talk and so we talked we build building bridges and open book series um building bridges i stress to them just like the panel was talking about earlier this is not something that i want just for black history month this is something that i want to keep permanently on our website and in our book um our books that we send out to patrons and they agreed. Um, so we have a program called Building Bridges that shows um, several diverse and inclusive books, um, Black, LGBTQ, Asian, so forth. Um, we have virtual programming um, on our, our website um, and we're working with outreach to actually get young Black and Brown youth into our libraries because there is um, a love for books in that community. They just have to see us in it um, and see that they're welcome into our branches. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Erin, you said you started the first diversity committee yes. at Frederick County. Yes. Can you tell us about that? Um, so basically we started with programming. Um, so my committee most is geared towards the programming and reaching more black and brown um, um, communities. Um, and so I started that out with the help of my program director to basically change our collection, well, not change our collection, just to add more diverse books to our collection um, and, and programming that gears towards um, the community. Can talk to me anytime by saying hi, you know, we, we serve. So, yeah. That is great. Can you, so 
And does, is, does that include staff training? <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So it includes staff training. That's something that we still, I think, in my opinion, need to probably work on a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, but um, it does include staff seminars and, and, and training and, um, and, and learning about how you actually, actually able to educate um, if you're not necessarily my color, uh, educate other people on diverse subjects. Mm -hmm. And how do you think those are best carried out when they're done branch by branch, or if it's everyone in the system, whether they're in person or virtual, or how do you think that people get the most out of that training? Um, right now, I think virtual, um, because we're not really together. Um, we're not able to really kind of get together just due to COVID. Um, my goal is to actually be able to get together and do diverse um, and inclusive groups um, and, and work from that platform. But right now it's all virtual. Mm -hmm. Right, that makes sense. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. And for all, your expertise, all of you, your expertise. <laughs> Man, I'm sitting, I'm sitting here like writing these, writing these notes down, you know. As a, as a young man. Okay, well, Michelle, some major hurdles that you overcame, that you faced. Um, well, my very first hurdles um, with becoming a librarian were time and money. Um, I went to library school while I was working full time as a library associate. Um, and back in those days, library school was still in person. Um, so I drove from Brooklyn Park, which is at the edge of Baltimore City, to Catholic University a few times a week. Um, and, and it was okay, but, but there was also some stress associated with that, um, even though there was some tuition reimbursement and I had that um, generous library associate salary. Sometimes I had more month than money. Um, <laughs> when I was looking to pay for food, clothing, tuition, fuel, and books. Um, but as a library associate in the branches, I was surprised to experience um, racism in the library, uh, mostly from the, from the patron side, um, my experience was. Um, it was shocking to me the first time I offered to help someone who didn't look like me and they either deferred my help or waited for someone who looked like them. Um, I had to, it took me a while to figure out that it wasn't me. You know, my feelings were hurt. I was angry about it. Um, but talking with other Black library staff helped me understand that it wasn't me. It was their problem. And one of my personal I guess, and professional goals was to turn those people around. And how did you do that? Um, dogged persistence and all of that great um, approachability training. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right, thanks, and that's it. What about Marcy Jasmine? I could go. Uh, oh, Marcy, do you wanna go? No, go ahead, you go. Um, one of the biggest hurdles that I faced early on in my library career was just basically having my ideas seen and heard and being seen as valid, concrete ideas that would be uh, a good idea for the community. So uh, I've predominantly worked in public libraries um, and I'm from Oklahoma. I, I moved there when I was about 13 and kind of came up um, through, through those systems. Um, but when I was a library associate, just as Michelle started off with her library career, um, in 2016, I um, started to like turn towards library book displays in order to kind of communicate with the community at large. Um, and this is right after Alton Sterling was killed by police. And I decided to create a book display, how to, you know, talk to people about you know, race, how to have these hard conversations with your family and friends, um, no descriptive language on it, just put the books out, kid, teen, and adult books. Um, and my supervisor approached me and said, if you have this Black Lives Matter display, you need to have an All Lives Matter display. 
So I immediately um, kind of was taken aback because I didn't expect that from another librarian, let alone a supervisor. Um, I did not take my display down because I still thought it was a good idea. Um, but I did notice that it was inspected quite a bit by administrators. So I feel like even though this happened five years ago, it still stings and you still want your ideas to be seen as good, solid, valid ideas and not met with hostility or uh, defensiveness um, and things like that. So um, that's just something that I've kind of ruminated on over the years and experienced. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, okay, so you're someone telling you that you should have an all lives matter display. Do you think that that would happen today? No, and that's what's really troubling for me. I, I almost want to say it feels kind of gaslighty, mm. <laughs> to be quite honest with you. Um, I feel like in 2020, to, to Aaron's point about, you know, um, having this diversity discussion around the murder of George Floyd, it is now in everybody's minds mm -hmm. and it's almost suffocating in a way, if that makes any type of sense. And I'm not sure if I went back to that same library system, if I said, okay, I'm gonna have this display, they would probably slap the, the term Black Lives Matter on it without me even saying anything. So it almost feels like it has to come from a different person for it to be seen as a valid idea or a good idea for the community. So I've been trying to like pick battles over the last, I don't know, couple of years in my career to keep my own mental sanity intact. Okay. Yeah, I'm just taking that in. And then you also mentioned the mental sanity, which is another big one that we all need to maintain. We all have our ways of maintaining. Let's see, I believe we got a question in the chat for Jasmine. Let me take a look here. I saw, I, was your display also taken aback by patrons as well in Oklahoma? Um, no, the patrons actually enjoyed it and they complimented me on making it inclusive. So mm -hmm. having uh, board books for little kids, um, you know, children's books, I tried to make it as inclusive with picture books as well. Um, things for the whole family to just basically talk about what's happening uh, around them and to people who may not necessarily look like them. Mm -hmm. Exactly. All right. Thank you very much. Well, Marcy, what about some major hurdles that you've overcome, that you've faced? Um, well, I just want to say to Jasmine, and isn't that a part of what the library is supposed to do? Aren't we supposed to, <laughs> I mean, um, help people to become more informed to learn, to grow, to stretch, um, no matter what the issue is. <laughs> but um, and so, but but I think I guess I encountered at least some of what um, you have you all have mentioned, and I would uh, say, in one case, I was older than most of my professors and fellow students when I went to library school because being a librarian is my third career. And so I felt somewhat like a fish out of water. And, and, and I got uh, several verbal and nonverbal questions about my age and why would I want to become a librarian at my age? Um, and I would think, well, why not? <laughs> uh, but I also encountered low expectations. And I think that that was probably the more damning of the things I encountered and hurdles that I needed to overcome. Um, can you really measure up? Can you write a paragraph? Can you speak clearly? Were all things that were said to me. <laughs> and so um, these are, are things that would Make a person make a person step back <laughs> and, and wonder. Um, I knew that I could do all of these things. I had been doing them for all of my life. <laughs> so the fact that I was in library school shouldn't necessarily change that. In fact, it should enhance those things. 
Um, and so, um, it, it, but I, I learned, um, and I've always liked maxims and proverbs. They kind of help me, uh, you know, navigate life. And I make my own isms sometime for mm -hmm. a conversation. And so um, I, you know, I, I use some of my own isms to work my way through there. And so, for example, one of the things I would say was, that's their issue. It's not a hill I'm going to die on. I will keep my focus on whatever my goal is, and they can figure it out as we go along. Um, but I, in other cases, when I was on the job, for example, and encountered some of these things, it, it really was better if I engaged people, so, similar to uh, Jasmine's display. If I figure out how to engage people, and I know this is not the question we're, that we're on, but some of my mentors were very good at helping me to understand and to, to purposely know what environment I was operating in, to make assessments about where I was, what was going on, what it meant, and what I needed to do to either um, engage in it, to change it, to, to, to do whatever it was that I thought that I needed to do. And so I, I purposely engaged my colleagues then in various activities that I believed would be beneficial to the library and to the users. And I've, I've done that my whole career. It, you know, I may uh, uh, not put up a display or I may, but I was always thinking about what's wrong with this picture? We need to do X, Y, and Z. And then I needed to figure out how to accomplish that. So those were some of my hurdles. <laughs> Can I say something, Ms. Marcy? Thank you so much. <laughs> I, 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 you just basically just, you fed me some good information because that is the exact same experience coming in at a later age into this, this type of environment. And I appreciate the way you interpret how you handled it. And I just, because I, sometimes I think that I'm crazy for bringing my perspective in here, you know, but I don't have I don't have no room to be fake, and I and I, I can't code switch. These are my real voices right now, and I need that in order to empower others that look like me coming into this. So thank you so much. Absolutely, and I have so many follow up questions, but I do want to ask. So Marcy, can you tell us some specific examples about those things that you had to? show them, you had to teach them when you were there, or that you had to engage them in so that they would get it? Mm -hmm. um, I can remember uh, having some summer activities where I was able to convince the dean that we needed to have a committee composed not just of librarians, but of library staff from all departments and from all levels of the library to work on certain issues. Um, and the reason I wanted to do that, or there were many reasons, but I wanted for people to not be so compartmentalized and to only consider what their job was, but really to understand the big picture and to understand what benefit the library was bringing to the campus. And so then, uh, Angela, when it came time for the budget discussions, we could say, <laughs> well, we serve X number of students and, every, and we need these resources to be able to serve them more. We could say um, the employers are saying that our students do not know how to read and reason well. That's our lane. We can help <laughs> you graduate students who will suit the needs of employers, who will be sought out because they are outstanding in doing these things. But if the um, technical services never spoke to the public services, 
uh, never spoke to the IT group, how would we know how we could work together to make this case to the administration or to the campus at large? And if we never asked the students what they needed, how would we know anyway? <laughs> so, so I convinced the Dean that it would be a good thing if we did this research, if we engaged broadly. And, and as we did that, and as people began to understand the value that they grew, their group brought to the whole equation and get some appreciation of the value of other groups, there was a whole different kind of environment and vibe even in the library. And people who came through the door could feel that. And so that, you know, but these were things that took time, you know, you know, it was one step at a time. How do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? And so, um, but as, who was it that said persistence? I forget one of you ladies said persistence. <laughs> it is persistence that wins. And, and sometimes because I'm a grandmother and I'm a, probably a Budinsky grandmother, um, the, the, um, the kids say, Nana is like a drop of water on the stone. <laughs> she just keeps going. She keeps saying what she says, doing what she does. And you know what? After a while, the stone gets a dent in it. And so that, that was the, you know, so to Angela, to your point, be encouraged because it will happen. If you believe in it enough and you have the passion, other people will come along and be a part of that dream. Mm -hmm. That's my answer, Joy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. I think the other thing is all of you, Angela, Marcy, Aaron, Michelle, Jasmine, you all have such diverse experiences before coming to the library. Many of you have been working for many years in other industries. So if you're starting library school, well, let's say you're not 23, okay? Well, you know, <laughs> you have all- How about twice that? <laughs> you, know, you have all this background, all this experience, you know, and, and how dare someone ask you, Marcy, can you write a paragraph? Oh, See, yeah. I've been writing since before you were born. <laughs> Excuse you. <laughs> I oh, couldn't have been. <laughs> I, you know. So, yeah, OK, well, all right. And, you know, I would like to just just very briefly, I would like to talk a little bit about your professional backgrounds before the library, just very briefly. So, Angela, can you start, please? Yes, um, before I had several lives like Miss Marcy, mm -hmm. <laughs> but my before I went into librarianship, I was I was doing two things. I was working as a um, senior treasury analyst for a Fortune 500 company. Mm -hmm. So, um, which coming into um, I worked in the library um, archives, having that analytical background um, actually helped in this, but I realized I am a little bit different than a researcher because researchers research the content and then write about the content. But in the analyst perspective, I had to research, analyze, and I had to come up with, with hard answers and not theories. So I'm very like outsider-ish when I think of that because I want outcomes. I want solid things coming from my research. I just don't want to just write a book. I want effectiveness in my community as a result of what I do. So that's the good thing about the analytical thing. And I also um, ran a nonprofit organization for 12 years. Um, I uh, teach dance, my background is a dancer. So um, I taught dance to the Baltimore City community for 12 years and um, we just recently shut it down um, because of COVID, but something else happened um, as a, I'm part of a project that's collabor collaborating with Johns Hopkins, where um, the cultural arts program that I researched and the program that I had in my in my community, we're going to be able to tap into that uh, that preservation uh, piece of the community through this project through the Mellon Grant, and they um, assigned me as director of the community archives project. So my different fields actually helped me 
um, move a lot faster in this uh, process of librarianship. And I'm, I'm very appreciative of my um, colleagues because, you know, I am that woman who just came in as 40 years old as a technician, you know, going to school, doing everything I'm supposed to do to, to try to get to this point. And I'm literally three weeks away from that, that finish line from that. But I can, I can say that I don't know where I would be able to do that anywhere else, to be able to, to, to do the things that I've done in this position. Um, has allowed me to create programs for my community, community archives workshops. Um, we did the Big Read project at the library. So they've effectively allowed me to do things without that, without that, uh, that credential, you know, but I'm, I'm there because of that support, so. Thank you. And Angela, I'm seeing a lot of praise for you in the chat. We're saying congratulations. Yeah. Go, Angela. Yeah. Oh, Absolutely. Goodness. Absolutely. Erin, what about your professional background before the library? Um, so I was in the auto industry for about 10 years. Um, I was a exec, customer relations exec for six, service manager for four. Mm -hmm. um, before I came into the library system, I was an English teacher for uh, writing and grammar. Um, and I also have, um, I teach uh, CPR and first aid and I've been doing that for eight years as well. Awesome. And I know that's already pretty self-explanatory, but how did those things fuel what you were able to accomplish at the library? Um, I think, customer relations, just being able to like interact with different patrons. Um, so that many years of, of having to deal with issues or, or, or praise, uh, hopefully more praise, but um, it, it, it actually helped um, with going into the library system and making those relationships with the patrons that we serve. Excellent, excellent, thank you. And Michelle, you told us you were in PR at the library, right? Right, I, I have a journalism degree. Um, it, it took me uh, more than four years to earn it, I will say that. Um, and in those years, I was working um, for a tool rental company as their office manager. Um, lots of men, lots of... Um, uh, workshop talk, lots of um, just, you know, it was dirty, it was gritty, it was uh, male, cent ma male centered. And, and while I love men, one of the things I think attracted me to the library was the presence of strong, smart women getting things done. I thought, oh, this is something I need to be a part of. Mm -hmm. No hate to any of the men. <laughs> in the audience. Well, wow. I love having you as a part of the library too. <laughs> All right, they understand. They understand. <laughs> Jasmine, what about your professional background for the library? Ah, I, unlike everybody else, I this has been my only career, right? right. So I started right. off working at my college library my last two years of, of college in stacks management. So basically doing the work that nobody else really wanted to do. So shelving, shifting, um, everything laborious in the library. Um, I also interned at the American Pigeon Museum and Library. It's a real place. Can you believe it? Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. Um, and then I took, a, I took some time to really think my senior year of college, like, what do I want to do? I had a history degree. Um, you know, I didn't want to necessarily be a teacher but I still wanted to be involved in some type of information background. Um, and my capstone professor said, well, you work in the library now, why not make it a career? Um, and I thought to myself, why would I do that? And it's, I realize it now, it's because I never saw any librarian who looked like me in the library. Therefore, I did not think of myself as having a place there professionally long-term. Um, I took a gap year worked at a health sciences library. I just couldn't get away. Um, and then I started library school and uh, no looking back. So after I graduated, um, I moved back to Baltimore and worked at the Pratt Library as the business librarian. Um, 
a short stint in DC and now I'm at UMBC. And that's great. And just like Michelle, you worked, you so you're in your position now, but you worked in various sects of the library, various different parts of the library. So you have that understanding, that full, well-rounded understanding of how the library functions. Which I think is a plus. I used to think, okay, no one's going to uh, want me to really talk about my experience in public libraries now being in academics, but it has really come in handy uh, because of that unique perspective and because we as public librarians are used to working with very little funds um, with a whole host of people to serve, right? So we, we kind of have to be uh, very versatile with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And Marcy, you told us, I remember in the beginning about your professional background, but could you tell us again where you were before the library? Oh, sure. Um, my first job was, um, in adoptions, I was a, an adoption home study worker and I approved families who wanted to adopt children. And then after the placement, I followed the families for six months to a year while they were coming together. And that was really um, a kind of exciting um, position because I was in a win-win place. Families who needed children were placed with, with children who needed families and you know, it was just wonderful. And after that, I worked for a brief while with Wednesday's Child, where I chose special needs children from all over the state of Maryland. Uh, I wrote the script um, so that they would be featured on a local TV uh, program. And people who were interested in adopting either sibling groups or children with special needs could call in and express interest. So again, that was very exciting um, for me um, to do that and to be able to have a part in children and families coming together. I was approached by a family service organization to come and work for them. And I thought, well, okay, why not? And so I became their director of development and public relations. And I worked there for several years. Um, and all along the way, um, you know, learning that what it was that could benefit uh, families and children in particular, and also learning that the skills that you acquire in one uh, chapter can be useful in another chapter of your life. And so um, by the time I was uh, in midlife, I decided that I really would go back to libraries because libraries were my first love and I wanted to be a librarian. And so rather than have a midlife crisis, I decided to become a librarian. And so um, that was, you know, kind of interesting though, because, you know, my family thought, well, well, you, you don't know how to use a computer and you don't like email and how is that going to work? But I was determined and I, you know, I just said, well, okay, I'm going to do this and I'm going to show you that it doesn't have to be a straight line, that things can, can in the end all work together. And so those careers really helped me, those, those other careers helped me when I became a librarian to be able to interact with all kinds of people, to listen well, to um, anticipate some of what might be helpful to them even before they ask the question. And, and to, and, and of course in library school, I then learned how to ask them that. <laughs> so, so it was, you know, it all, it all fit together. And, and so even though they were separate and distinct, to me, they're all related. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you, Marcy. Thank you for sharing. Uh -huh. Now, I just want to remind the audience to please put in your questions in the chat if you have any at any time, and then we will probably be asking them periodically, and then we'll also be ask, ask, answering some at the end. So I just wanted to remind everybody of that. But I, we did have another question that came in. I'm going to tie it to another one of our questions because I think that it fits in nicely. So the question is, my question is, they say, what can we as a profession and as individual libraries do to reach out to potential employees about our library job openings? 
And I think that that goes into, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'll start there. We'll start there. What about um, Aaron? What do you think? Um, I think there's different forums, um, HBCUs, um, um, high schools, um, to get to get young people interested in the library system. Mm -hmm. um, I think sometimes if you start young, all the way up to all the way down to elementary school, and making sure that you're visible from elementary all the way up to college. Um, they will find an interest in the library system and they'll come. Um, I think that just that outreach of getting out to schools and, and high schools are beneficial to, to getting a more diverse group. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And even preschool maybe, right? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have anything to add to that? Um, this is why um, us doing library outside of the physical is so important. Um, I think Michelle mentioned about how now outreach is important. And it is important because when we collaborate with different community members, um, we're, we're bringing more attention to what we are as, as information science professions. I, am, I think this is the best profession on the planet. And I can't imagine one one day without us. Can you imagine just shutting down libraries, digital and everything, including the Library Congress? How would how would society function without us? So that's that's how I feel about it. And that's that's the energy that I bring to my community. And they always ask me, well, what is this? And why are you there? Why wouldn't I be here? This is the best place to provide resources to engage this to engage society with the answers that they need. So the outreach portion works and also collaborate collaborative efforts with the community, not just trying to say that you have something to give them. Let's let's share in this. Let's figure this out. And um, I came here as that as that patron. I came into this this field as a patron and I have not left. And I'm hoping to bring people like me coming in and saying, hey, I'm not going anywhere because I literally didn't go anywhere. I said, I am not leaving this place. <laughs> so it's, it's been, it's been um, almost eight years. I've been sitting in my same place, like I said I would, but I'm not just sitting there. It's actually gradually um, uh, changing things and shifting the narrative and what that looks like. What does librarianship looks like? It is not that that introvert anymore with the glasses. Well, I have glasses, but we're not just sitting. <laughs> we're not just sitting there reading books. We are, we we are futuristic. Google can't can't compete with us. They just can't. So, I'm bringing that energy into this, and I'm just excited that uh, talking with you because you you all have inspired me to move and, and shift forward. Um, being um, African American and I'm, and I'm always I, I know people get tired of me saying that but the, the, the statistics of over 80% of white women in one field is astonishing to me you know it, and as much as and much as you get tired of me saying that how you don't get tired of that being that way and it's gone up since last year you know it's gone up the discussion has been since the 70s. The ALA created this diversity thing, but yet we still are less than 5% represented in this in this field. So I don't know, I, I, I've gone somewhere else, but yeah. So. That's all right, I'm there with you. Okay. I'm in the okay. car with you. <laughs> and Angela, I think that's why it's so important for people to see me out there. I don't want any uh, little girl like Jasmine to come into my library and feel like they don't have a place there. I love being behind that counter to represent um, Black intelligence, Black success, Black librarians at work. That just made me just a, a quick aside that made me think of just yesterday, I was talking to this a mother and I believe her two daughters, all black, and they all had beautiful braids. The mom had twists and the two girls had beautiful long braids. And I said to all of them, but I especially said to the youngest one, she was maybe eight years old. I said, I love your braids. I miss mine, but I love your braids. <laughs> and I just felt the need, I just really had to say that to her just on the hair aspects because they need to know, just like we all needed to know. 
that our hair is beautiful. Mm -hmm. And we still need to know. Right? Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I can share uh, just a, a simple example of what I experienced. Um, what, what, I, what everybody said is, is really great. Uh, it, it, for several times, I've been invited to come to career days at high schools or um, also community colleges. And uh, I always accepted those invitations, even though they may not have been convenient for me to go to, but for the very reasons that you're saying in terms of representing the profession to people who look like me. And so, um, I, and often in the high schools in particular, I would be introduced as a librarian and there would be football players in the back of the room always with their arms folded and with scowls on their faces. And they didn't want to hear what a librarian had to say, for goodness sake. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I would start to talk about how I became a librarian and what things I did and what I liked about being a librarian. And I would see the arms unfold and I would see them lean forward in their chairs. And then they would raise their hands and ask questions. They would, they would say, tell us again about, or tell us some more about, or where did you say you went to school to learn to be a librarian? You know, it, it was the, just the most amazing thing that within a half an hour to 45 minutes, they were asking me questions. And so I just uh, totally found that exciting. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we had a question in the chat that goes very well with what we're talking about right now, but it says, they say, I'm a black woman and currently an LIS professor. However, I stumbled into librarianship after first earning a degree in exceptional education. The library land is where I was meant to be. As a teen, I entered in a library headed by a black woman, but not once did she talk with me about librarianship, that librarianship could be a career path. Hmm. All that to get to this. Do any, all of you, or, or all of you, have opportunities to encourage other Black women and men to consider librarianship. I want to just chime in real quick. I, um, I, we've we've had a lot of interns coming in to our um, library and archives, and um, I inspire through the students. I tell them how important this position is. Um, I'm sitting in the heart of Baltimore where it's like over 60% of African-Americans in this little small community. And it's not reflected in a lot of the, um, the staff in a lot of libraries. We don't see any presence. Now I heard a lot, you know, doing some readings that the, the myth is that African-Americans aren't being a part of this because we don't, they don't make a lot of money. Um, that might be the case in some places, but we we are in a lot of fields that don't make money. You know, we are teachers. We are we are crossing guards. We are other things. But why aren't we present in this particular field as as much as we should be? Especially when you're in a surrounding community that represents a specific uh, demographic. Um, I think that my presence in that in in my my presence in my department for the, my surrounding community is what's gonna help bring people to that. Oh, doing the outreach, them seeing representation, seeing that, that stuff that we have in the library does represent them and that's important to me. Freeing of African-Americans, I have to say the word free because we all know how freeing it is to be educated, how free it is to have knowledge that we didn't have prior about ourselves and, and where we come from. Our university does have these type of contents, but they don't know that it exists. So I'm out there letting them know, look, this is what we have here. This is how, you know, that street used to look like 50 years ago. So my presence, I'm, I'm very loud. I'm an artist by trade. So, you know, that performing arts thing does come in handy, <laughs> but I, I just, I just put emphasis on trying to influence young women and men of the impact. And we've had a lot of interns who spent time in our department saying, yeah, this is something I'm thinking about doing. I, I'm, I'm just really excited. And we had an intern coming in as a photographer. Um, 
a brilliant artist and she's going to be coming back as a fellow in the archives so because this is the career that she wants to the path she wants to go in so mm -hmm. hey. And also this makes me want to ask you guys, how do you think that young, or they aren't young, how do you think that librarians of color can best support as they start in this profession on a, on a smaller scale, like on a person to person scale? I think finding a sense of network, a sense of community um, would be the first step. Um, when I went to library school, it was all online. Um, I believe I was the only black person, black woman in my graduating class. Um, so it wasn't until after I graduated and you know joined the workforce as a professional that I found a sense of community um, majority online. Um, I'll pop in the chat some places and avenues that I have followed throughout the years. Um, and they've been a really good asset for me to just kind of turn to, to meet other black librarians, other people of color in my area, um, to kind of bounce ideas off of, to, you know, join webinars, meetings and things like that. Finding that community early um, rather than later is, is really beneficial. Mm -hmm. Michelle, I think that you were talking about earlier how the people that helped you were they made it their business to really understand what you were dealing with and where you were? I, I, I uh, in general, I think that um, librarians of color can be mentored by anyone in the profession who wants them to succeed mm -hmm. and who has the energy and experience and the time to devote to that success. Um, I have been fortunate to be mentored by people from a lot of different backgrounds. Uh, I've been very lucky in that respect. But being able to check in with Black librarians who understand my unique experience has been invaluable. Um, mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. having that network, um, even just colleagues um, that you can talk to about people wanting to touch your hair. Everyone doesn't understand that, but my panel that I'm talking to right now understands that. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Someone said, oh boy. <laughs> yes, looking at the chat here. Absolutely. <laughs> now someone asked someone asked in the Q&A just going back a little bit does anyone know if enrollment in library master's programs is statistically changing so that the future libraries will not be 80% white women Angela anybody does anyone know I did, if... I did I did have these numbers early part of this year and I apologize I should have had that but I am because I'm an I analyst background numbers and data that I'm always looking at and we did, we did move from 3.8 from 2018 to almost 5%. So that is not quite 5%, <laughs> but mm. it's better than 3.8 from 2000, the last study in 2018. Well, Angela, yeah. we're on our way. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Well, 5%, you know what? That is better than 3.8, you're right. Yeah, you're right. absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that online programs uh, might make librarianship more accessible. Mm. Right, right. Or I hope that they do. I hope they do. Mm -hmm. Right. And then there's there's issues with not being able to access something online if you don't have the technology or if you're not in a place where you would get good enough reception. But those are things, there are some things that the library can help with, and there are some things the library needs to partner with someone else to get, right? Or other things that other agencies are, need to handle. But there was another comment. A lot of us are unable to afford getting an MLS too. I would love to see more grants and scholarships that allow more people of color to become librarians. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm-hmm. 
but that was just a comment that somebody made. Someone also asked a question, Joy, what is your background? You're a great moderator. Well, thank you. <laughs> That's very kind. <laughs> well, just a little, want to talk about me. Um, my background, <laughs> well, my background, I have a theater background and I have a Spanish tutoring background. So I studied Spanish and I studied theater performance and technical theater in college. So I was working in production. I was working with some professional theater companies for a while and I was also tutoring Spanish. I'm fluent in Spanish. And I traveled a little bit. I studied abroad in Colombia and I've been to Guatemala and Ecuador a little bit. So that's a little bit about my background. Yeah, theater and Spanish and yeah, that's a little bit about me. Well, thank you very much for that compliment. But uh, let's see, I want to ask you guys also, you are all very successful librarians, working in libraries. What is your biggest success? I want to hear Miss Marcy. Miss <laughs> <laughs> Marcy. Well, then you put me on the spot here. Um, I thought about the question, Joy, because, you know, it could go a lot of ways, but I I thought about you know uh, the company that that I was in, and so the the one that I really want to focus mm -hmm. on, and then I'll mention one other one, is the work that I did with um, the the Maryland Public Libraries. I I've been on a number of exciting uh, library projects, but the successful and award winning public library campaign called Maryland Public Libraries. It's never too early was what I consider a, a very successful um, activity mm -hmm. that I had a small part in. Um, I worked briefly in public libraries and became the marketing consultant to the 27 public library systems in the state of Maryland. And I helped to continue and expand their efforts around early literacy. The project was then invited to the White House by Mrs. Laura Bush and subsequently won the John Cotton Dana Award. It was a highly collaborative effort to expand literacy offerings in all these library systems. So it often felt to me like I was trying to get 27 porcupines to hug each other <laughs> and to work together. Um, but there were other times when things went together seamlessly. And in my estimation, the end justified the means. Uh, by that, I mean that that campaign has benefited countless young children throughout the state of Maryland. And it has given many talented and creative librarians a focus to help children to learn to read and to enter, or rather to enter school ready to learn to read. And so for me, even though um, I had a very small part in it, I just feel like it was valuable because to Angela's point, it is all about the benefit to your community. And so the uniqueness um, of what was offered in each library system under the heading of Maryland Public Libraries, it's never too early, was wonderful because each library system, no matter how uh, well-funded or how not well-funded, could actually use what they had to work to benefit their communities and the children in their communities. And so I just got goosebumps thinking about what we could do for the children when we work together. And so I feel like that was a success that will outlast all of us, you know, all of us who worked on it. But additionally, I've had the great pleasure of mentoring a number of people. And when you ask the question about um, mentoring, I try to mentor people in the way that I was mentored. That is to listen and to encourage and to sometimes give a swift kick if need be, um, because we all could use all those things, I think. And so um, I've had um, librarians who 
uh, became Spectrum Scholars, who became ACRL Fellows, Libraries, librarians who are hardworking, productive people. One who works at Google, no harm to Google. Um, <laughs> uh, there are several who are library directors, one library dean. And so I figured these are all successes and these will all serve to uh, benefit them as well as the communities that they serve in part because one of the things that they have all gathered is the si se puede, the yes we can, Joy, the yes we can attitude. And to me, that is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's si se puede. That's right. <laughs> That's right. And my apologies. Thank you for also answering that question about the mentoring. I would also like everyone, if you would like to, to also answer that question, how can people best be mentored when they're coming into this industry? But Aaron, I want to go to you next. If you could answer that question, if you'd like, but also what is your biggest success? Um, I, I would say my biggest success was, um, my, like I mentioned earlier, um, bringing um, more diverse and inclusive programming um, virtually through COVID um, for FCPL um, and working with my program director, which has been great with me um, and getting that out to, to people of all races. Um, changing our collection to where I'm seeing now more diverse books in our library system and they're displayed with pride um, so, um, I would say that was that so far, that's been one of my biggest success. And I, I would like to expand on that, um, after COVID, um, and what was that? <laughs> what was the question? I'm sorry. Is, if, if you have any, any input about how people can best be mentored when they're coming into, how people of color can best be mentored coming into librarianship. I think, um, just learning the whole system. Um, just like everybody else, um, learning collections, learning circulation, um, learning the dis different aspects of the library system so they can be well-educated um, and feel welcome. Understanding the whole system and not just what is in your job description, exactly. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and you said circulation, key point, you can't have a library without circulation. <laughs> That's why it's called circulation. You don't have you don't have a living body without the circulation of blood. <laughs> That's the way I think about it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. What about Jasmine? Oh, my biggest success would probably be something that is more more individualized. Mm -hmm. So when I was working at the uh, Central Library at Pratt, I was the business librarian. And in that role, I was tasked with helping people basically do research while they were in the early stages of creating their business. So from the business plan to implementation, to finding money, to, you know, getting a brick and mortar set up with them along the step, every step of the way. Um, and that's something that I kind of hold on to, especially knowing that Baltimore tends to get a bad reputation every single time it's on the news, something negative is happening. Um, so seeing that tenacity, seeing that determination, seeing uh, people really trying, it's something that I wish everybody could see, right? Something that I wish everybody could see instead of, you know, X, something that was bad on the news just happened. Let's never go there. So working with these individual people just really made me realize this city has a lot of hidden gems in people, but we just need to work to kind of build them up and to show them like, hey, there's this free resource or, hey, you know, you could get this at home, you know, remotely, you don't have to come here next time. You got your library card, log in, you know? So um, that's my biggest success, um, especially knowing that they still kept in touch with me and were like, come to my grand opening, like high praise, like that's, that's huge for me. Um, and as far as mentoring new people in the field, I would say with kindness and compassion, only because you have no idea what these black and brown employees have gone through previously to get to where they are today. 
coming into librarianship. So kind of, you know, having that extra kindness, that extra compassion, um, realizing that you may not know X, Y, and Z um, is something to take into consideration when you're mentoring. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, thank you for your insight. And Michelle. Uh, I'm pretty excited about um, the impact that I've had on staff. Um, I work hard to create a fun and productive branch um, in front of and behind the desk. Um, we're able to provide great customer service um, and have a pretty good time while we do it. And we genuinely enjoy one another's company. Um, I'm also proud that I've, um, uh, of helping to grow new staff. Um, in Anne Arundel County and, and maybe beyond. Um, I've watched staff that I've chosen be promoted to other jobs um, and other staff that I've coached or trained be successful in their careers and move forward in some way. So I'm pretty excited about that. And, and I agree with Jasmine about the mentoring. Um, be available and, and be kind. Absolutely. And Angela. Um, I'm a little hangry, so it's making me emotional. <laughs> but when I think about success in the library, I don't, I feel like I'm a little oddballish to this because my, my perspective comes from a different place that is so much, much larger than myself. That is so important. It's so important that tools, oh, I wrote this down because I just recently watched, um, watch Judas and the Messiah and um, the person who played um, Fred uh, uh, Fred Hampton, is that his name, Fred Hampton? Mm -hmm. He said that um, Fred Hampton, he was very educated. He, the, the love that he had for his community, the love that he had for people that look like him and how he was freed by education and that he was the, the he said uh, he wanted to give the tools to the community to set themselves free. And that's just such a powerful thing that we have, not necessarily the power, but we have that, that key to help people empower themselves. That, that's the success. Um, personally, I came in here um, not planning on being where I'm at. But I came in with a vision, hoping that people would listen to me. And not only are people listening to me seven years later, um, I'm influencing a, a whole community. I mean, we, we are now getting so many people wanting to understand what archives is. It's like, I, I, you know, be careful what you ask for, because I <laughs> have literally overwhelmed my whole department with... <laughs> <laughs> with requests of collaborations and um, I influ influenced Johns Hopkins because they are the power in this city, you know, and, and a, a, a speck of, of light came in from something that I influenced and how, in, how important preservation and archives and librarianship is important to people that look like me. It's so important. So the success in that was I kept, I'm saying the same thing I said prior to my MLS de degree. It's, I stayed that course for seven years and now I'm working on a $4.4 million grant to do exactly what I, what I wanted to do seven years ago. So that's the success in that. I just stayed persistent in my mission, but it was the love that kept me here because it was not easy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's right. You have seen the applause, seeing the applause in the chat. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And I saw a quick question there. Was it Fred Hammond? No, it's Fred Hampton. And I saw that Monica <laughs> put in the chat, I believe, Judas and the Black Messiah from our catalog. All right, we do have a couple more questions here. Or there was a comment. Somebody said MLA is becoming an affiliate of BCALA, merging with Maryland Black Librarians. The group will be looking for officers, programming, and more. If you're interested, please email smorris at jhu.edu. Subject line, interested in BCMLA. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. 
And someone asked a very, very important question. Thank you for being so passionate about what you do. Do you get tired doing what you do? And that was primarily to Angela. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, I, and I'm not ashamed of it. Wine does help, but well, um, <laughs> I, I don't, I, I, I don't. I've been in, like I say, various careers. I thought my success was being this, this corporate business profession, making all of this money, sitting in this cubicle. I thought that was my success story. This, that was not my success story. This is my success story. We have, my, me and my city, we have a love-hate relationship. They don't understand what I'm doing, but I'm gonna do it anyway, you know? <laughs> and, and, and yeah, I get angry, I fuss, and, and they, they see that part too. But at the end of the day, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not afraid, I'm not scared of them. So there, there are times that I get that way, but I have a, a nice community of family and friends and support. And I'm hoping to get to know the panelists because y'all are freaking amazing. But um, that type of strength does help carry me through all of this. Cause like I said, it's, I was asking for all of this and it just came all just at one time. Angela, you're doing 20 <laughs> things um, right now and you gotta be great at all 10. So I, yeah, wine helps. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> I hear you. Okay. Right. Anyone else have anything to add to that one? Do you get tired of doing what you do? I'm sure the answer is yes, sometimes. Yes. I mean, that's yes. anyone who works hard at their job gets tired sometimes. Yes. But I did want to ask you guys this question too. Would you recommend the profession to other people of color knowing what you know now? I think the answer is yes. And we've talked about this a lot, but does anyone else have anything to say as far as that? I say absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. There are libraries almost everywhere. Mm -hmm. So you can work almost anywhere. Um, there's a variety of tasks, there's lots of opportunity, there are different positions. Um, again, um, as a Black librarian, I love it that people who look like me can come into my branch and see me. Um, and every once in a while, I like to surprise people who don't look like me by being there. <laughs> All right, absolutely. <laughs> And for any of you, what surprised you most about working in the libraries that we haven't mentioned yet? Any surprises? And it could be about anything. I didn't realize librarian just, and I'm gonna say, I can only go from the perspective of working on a university. And like I said, I come from a corporate background and it, you know, I managed, Billions of dollars. I was, my, I was managing cash flow, and that was very stressful. I would come home and not even be able to sleep. But my surprise, you know, to my surprise, I'm like, library is pretty gangster <laughs> because it's a, it's a lot of political things that I did not know. I was like, this is just books. What do you? So I was. It was hard for me to try to understand that concept. Me coming from a stressful environment thinking I'm going into something that's not stressful when it actually is stress, but it's just a different form of stress. Right. So that that's what surprised me, that it is a lot of politics that go on within, within on a university campus for librarians. And like I said, that budget thing, that budget constraint, how dare you not prioritize a place where everyone has to come to get information, so. Aaron, wait, Aaron go ahead. I think for me, um, the programs that were offered, I think me growing up, I didn't realize that all these programs were offered within the library system, you know, and um, just those programs that are offered. And I just imagine, you know, single moms or even not single moms, but certain areas when they can not find certain things to do with their kids um or they're working two to three jobs um some of those resources that they have to offer within the library system um, i didn't know that growing up so that was a big surprise for me mm -hmm. yeah and there was a question for you aaron not to put aaron on the spot 
but as someone who seems to look younger, I would love to hear what you think about these issues, but not to put Aaron on the spot. <laughs> um, so uh, what issues? Um, issues uh, I believe maybe that was maybe that was in reference to the question that I just asked. Oh, okay. but, um, anything, anything else, Aaron? We're all fascinated. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think um, coming in, um, I guess I'm glad that I'm looking a little bit younger these days. But coming in, um, sometimes they don't take you seriously, being young and being black. Um, so making sure that you have your what you want to say down, what you want to accomplish within the system, um, and bringing that to um, head people in charge. Sometimes your, your supervisor, your manager may, may not be listening, but being able to make that conversation with other head um, individuals um, that may actually want to make that change. And in my case, I found that. So, um, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Aaron. Anyone else? Please. Anything that surprised you about working in the library? Oh, I just want. Oh, Ooh, go I'm ahead, sorry, Jasmine. Go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, a quick thing. One thing that surprised me was how often people assume that we read all the time when we're at work, <laughs> and I hate that so much. Like, you don't see me like lugging these books around or like getting ready for a program. Like, we do. We do not get to read at the desk. We're doing so much behind the scenes work. Um, but I think that kind of goes into the misconceptions of what people think we do while we're at work. So I think kind of using that as like a teaching moment to say, you know, hey, this is what I do in a day um, to kind of get people uh, aware of what we do, but also interested in the process. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And Marcy, I did want to mention, <laughs> I know that we have not mentioned it yet, but there was on the first slide saying that you are the retired Dean of the Library at Liberty University, first woman and first black person, Dean of the Library at Liberty University. Just wanted to mention that. Just wanted to, <laughs> just okay. wanted to mention that one time. <laughs> we don't have to harp on it, but I did okay, want to. That's true. Because actually I wanted to go back to the surprise question yes, just please, a little bit please, just to please. add. Um, it, to, to what the others have said. One of the things that really surprised me was the complexity of libraries. Mm -hmm. And I just, even though I had worked in the library during high school and college, by the time I got to library school, things were changing and they are continuing to change rapidly. And one of the things that um, I saw some librarians doing was getting off kilter because of the rapidly changing environment. Um, and, and so for example, I went from sitting behind the desk when I was in high school and college and answering the question if they dared to approach me <laughs> to <laughs> roving reference and then library 7, 24 seven library service. You know, it, it's a whole different world that we're in. And so I, you know, I have a card catalog in my house. It, I, I bought it from one of the libraries that I helped to automate because I wanted it for a reminder of, you know, where we've come from. I talked to my grandchildren about using the resources of the library. They don't know what it's like to have a set of encyclopedias in their house. They go online, they go to Google and TikTok. And I say to them, okay, great, wonderful, but also go to Gale Reference, <laughs> you know, online. And so, you know, and so, uh, and let it be read to you while you're doing something else. The article can be read to you. And so th these are like things that, I would not have even imagined in my wildest dreams when my first library didn't have a copy machine and 
goodness knows a computer was um, thought of. And so this is like um, a whole new world, <laughs> like the song, a whole new world. And so, and to me, that really makes it exciting. And so then to get to your question, of course I would recommend it to people. <laughs> of course I would say to them, if you have a particular passion that you want to pursue, if you have something that you're interested in doing, if you are curious and want to always be saying, well, what if, <laughs> or let's look at this a different way, the library is the place for you. You couldn't, you know, pick a better place. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else have anything to say in response to that question or anything else? I just or wanted to uh, get a little bit of that Angela fire going for the uh, public library side. Uh, what surprised me and delighted me was how quickly we figured out how to serve our customers in a pandemic and the many different ways that we serve them um, from online resources and expanding the availability of them to COVID testing, to COVID vaccines, to drive-through food pantries. I mean, we figured that out so quickly and did it so well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so to me, that then says, aren't we capable, aren't we creative and productive? And so when you want to talk about who you're going to give the funds to, look at what we did mm -hmm. <laughs> and get your mm -hmm. customers to tell them what you did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And I do want to say to people, I know that it's past 8.30, but you you, you knew that it was a, it was possible that when you register for this program, we could go to 2 a.m. We're not going to. <laughs> but I did want to say <laughs> that I know it's past 8.30. I know that if you do have to leave, then you have to leave. That's all right. But we do have a couple more questions. I just want to make a final call. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat, and then we will do our best to get to them. There was a quick question here for Angela. How do I get in touch with you? <laughs> <laughs> Angela, um, if you feel comfortable saying out loud or putting in the chat? I'll put it in the chat. Um, absolutely. I will send, give you my um, email address um, and my my, full, my government name. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you can find me. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm very accessible through email. I'll, I do answer and respond. But here you go. <laughs> Thank you, Angela. Thank you for that. Somebody asked back to mentorship. Do you have a current POC mentor? Do you have a current mentor of color? If not, who has helped shape your career? A lot of you answered this question already, but does anybody have anything else to say in response to that? I I have a uh, POC mentor. She's a black woman. She's amazing, um, and has not only helped me in my career of being a librarian, but has helped me onboard in a new job, right? I started at UMBC in the middle of the pandemic, only remote for a whole year. So that was amazing to kind of have her to lean on. Um, but she also helped me transition from public library to academic library, which is a very daunting experience. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's it's a complete 180 of, of thinking in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, she's great. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And just to give people an idea, what is what is something that was very different from going from public library to academic? Yeah, so one thing, um, I'm considered faculty, mm -hmm. 12 months, all year, I don't get any summers off or anything. Um, and one thing that you have to kind of do in order to get through the promotion process to become like a next step up librarian is to publish articles in academic journals, um, things like that. In the public library, that's very much like you don't have to do that for your job. You know, it's it's not a requirement, um, but this is. So she's helped me kind of seek out publication opportunities, get in touch with the right folks to find new opportunities uh, down the road, um, and things like that to kind of fine tune my writing skills too. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Anyone else, as far as mentorship? 
Michelle, did you have a mentor? Oh, go ahead, Angela. No, I will say if you want to go, please. I, you had your hand up. Oh, I'm, I'm just, oh, I do have my hand up. Hold on. <laughs> I, I just want to say I don't I don't have a mentor of color right now, but I have a mentor who has been with me since the beginning, even going to my interview uh, at library school or for library school. So she's a good egg. She's been around a long time and very supportive. My mentor, ironically, is um, a white man, <laughs> Aiden Faust. Um, However, he was mentored by an African-American woman, um, Leslie King Hammond. Um, so her influence um, helped him and, and in her influence, it came to help me. So I consider her my mentor in, in, you know, from a distance. <laughs> um, also, you know, the, the field I, I'm in is in librarianship is archives, trying to find mentors as a black archivist is definitely a challenge. Um, I, I was trying to, I was, you know, trying to research and see if I can find any. And then all of a sudden a lot of them have popped up. But what stood out for me was um, Carrie Beth Cryer. She was an archivist for the Afro in the nineties. And I, I found the video footage of her in our, um, in our collection, in our repository. And I was just so fascinated by this woman. Um, she was also a photographer. She took a, she took, she chronologed, she took pictures during her childbirth of herself giving birth. It was weird, oh, wow. but oh, wow. <laughs> that's what she's known for. So I'm sitting here like obsessed with this woman who, who passed away, like I think in like 97 to come to find out that I knew her daughter, I actually went to school with her daughter. So every other week I'm sitting in the floor of her house, um, helping her um, or organize her mother's papers, not knowing that I told her this had to be this had to be set in, in the universe because I didn't even know this was your mother and I'm sitting here with her papers so oh, I, I consider her my mentor even though she's not here but she, being there and sitting with her daughter and just she was an archivist so her stuff was perfectly organized already but to sit in the space and see this is extraordinary for me. And Marcy, Aaron, your mentors? I don't have a mentor of color, but um, my program th director, he has been my mentor for FCPL. Um, but um, my history teacher in college was my mentor. Um, that's when I really knew that I really loved to research. And my passion for books um, was in history. Um, so that's um, that professor was black and um, they became a mentor. Mm -hmm. I have two mentors who have been with me since I started library school and all through my professional career. They have been librarians, librarians for me. Um, and they, um, one is black and one is not one is female and the other is not. And so they give a good balance, but they remember more about me than I remember about myself. Um, and they have always um, been a source of inspiration for me and to me and a source of encouragement. So when things were going south, you know, they could always uh, help me find the North Star. <laughs> And so I have really, you know, appreciated and benefited from their um, mentoring of me over the course of many, many years. I can't tell you, you know, how they've helped me, how much they have helped me. And also I should mention though, that when I was first approached to uh, participate in this panel, I started to make a list of all the black librarians who had taken time to let me do informational interviews or who had, I had met at conferences or who would just uh, allow me to pick up the phone and call them and ask, uh, you know, whatever question I had. The list was about 50 people. I didn't realize that I was the beneficiary of the help of so many black librarians, but I have been. And so, 
that's the least I could do then is to try to help some others to come forward. Yeah, it's been great. And, and there's a song uh, that says, never could have made it. I never could have made it without them. Absolutely. And there was a question. If you guys would put your contact information in the chat for audience members, you do not have to. But if you are comfortable, people would like to get in touch with you. So if you wanted to put your email or contact in the chat. So does anyone else have any other Anything that you wanted to talk about that we did not mention today that you wanted to mention during our discussion? We are about to wrap. I, I do want to just bring up a conversation because I'm in, um, in my, as a student, because I am representing the um, MLS program at University of Maryland College Park. Um, Dr. Hill is giving an awesome diversity inclusion um, course in it. And this last topic is about librarians in prison and um, how influential it is for Maryland because Maryland has the highest population of, of black men in prison. Um, and we also are the richest state in the country. You wanna put the correlation together for that. Um, coming from Baltimore, yes, this is systemic problem where I'm from. And um, they were saying in the articles, it was saying how libraries are not um, in the prison, aren't fine, are not placed in the budget and people really don't show up. But I talked to my stepfather who was in prison and he said I was, it was okay to talk about it, that that's where he went, to every, you know, everyone, he, when he was in prison, that's where people went because they needed to learn how um, to read their cases. And librarians was like, like the best thing that could have happened to, to uh, prisoners um, when he was going there. And the first, the librarian that he um, was under, she actually went to Yale and taught him writing. And he later came out, he's been a, a minister for, for years. He's, his dialect is just so articulate, just so articulate. I mean, he doesn't speak like he's from Baltimore, you know, and, and he says that learning how to read and how important it was into learning and researching. He all he got that from prison from a librarian. And he said many people coming in there couldn't even read at third grade level, but how influential librarians were in these prisons. So I just I know we all have different aspects of what librarianship looks like, but we also have to consider the, the um, systemic issues in the prison and how important our presence are in that in that aspect. Yeah. And Maryland you. had a great librarian of prisons that was uh, uh, who who is now retired, um, librarian of color who worked for the Maryland prison system, uh, Glenner Shirley, um, and she was and is always available to to help a sister out mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> as needed to answer questions, to provide support, to offer guidance. She's wonderful. She is still active in Maryland libraries, but retired. Anybody else before we close? All right, I'm not seeing any more questions. So we're going to close our discussion today. Thank you so much, Michelle, Marcy, Jasmine, Aaron, and Angela for such an informative, compelling, and honest discussion. Thank you so much for your expertise and for your commitment. And thank you to all of our audience members who are able to join us tonight. And thank you, Monica and Katie, for putting all of this together. Thank you so much. Incredible, incredible. Now, everybody, please feel free to visit our website for more events. We've included the link to our events page in the chat. Also, we'd love to know what you think. Please feel free to complete our program feedback form. We've added that link to the chat as well. But until next time, good night, everybody. Good night, Joy. Bye. Good night, Good night everyone. Good night, ladies. Thanks for including me. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you for being here.